Uh, Tony, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to uh, uh, Gruenthal for asking me to come. Thank you for coming to listen. Uh, these are some conflicts of interest, and I just want to make a, a point here about conflicts of interest. We're in the process of uh, doing a large systematic review and meta-analysis on some of the Tepentadol studies, and uh, we're doing it at the level of the individual patient. I'm not going to be able to talk about all of that today, and in fact, it's not yet complete. But the point is this, and it's an important point to make. It's because pharmaceutical companies and academia work together like this that we have obtained really important insights into the nature of response in pain and uh, how better to translate the results of clinical trials into clinical practice. So, for the purposes of uh, this talk here about osteoarthritis, uh, Gronenthal made available uh, trial data from studies to the end of 2014. We had two large RCTs and two cohorts with uh, 2,000 patients. We had pain scores, patient global impression of change, and other measures available at various points during the trial. And we had a large amount of uh, other information as well, which gives us un these unique possibilities for deriving insights into um, outcomes. Uh, and I'm going to show you now some uh, unpublished data from the ongoing analyses. Anybody who's followed me around this meeting will know that I'm fixated by outcomes. And the reason for this is very simply that it is the most important thing we have. If we know what the right outcome is and we know how those are obtained, then we can interpret the results of trials uh, properly. And you can define it in all sorts of ways, but it is essentially a consequence, a result, something that you can use as a verdict on a treatment. And I want to concentrate on three different aspects of outcomes in OA studies now. The choice of different outcomes, the consistency of an outcome, and whether there is any predictability of an outcome. So let's look at choice of outcomes first of all. We can use the percentage reduction in pain intensity of a baseline. That is a change. Some people like it. I do. Not everybody does. We can use the pain measure at the end of the trial, how much pain people actually have. That would be a measure of the pain state. Or we can use the patient global impression of change, which some people would regard as a patient reported outcome, though in truth all of these are patient reported outcomes. So use a very simple one comparing the percentage reduction in uh, pain over the course of a trial uh, with the pain intensity at the end of the trial. Here, looking with tepentadol at the percentage of patients with a final pain intensity of less than four. And you can see if you've got more than 50% pain intensity reduction, almost everybody attains that. And if you don't, very few do. Similarly, if one looks for the uh, people with a uh, patient global impression of change compared with their pain intensity at the end of the trial, there at the top, those people with low pain intensities largely say that they're very much or much improved, whereas those with high pain scores uh, tend to think that there's no change or worse. So all of these outcomes are giving us very much the same result, and that's consistent with, with information from other studies in chronic and acute pain as well. And I want to talk about consistency. Now, what I'm going to show you are a whole series of lines. Each of these lines is an individual patient. And we've used a very, very conservative uh, imputation method here. That is, whenever a patient withdraws for any reason whatsoever, even if it's just because they missed the bus, uh, then uh, that is given, uh, uh, counted as a withdrawal, a failure, and the patient is given the pain intensity that they started with. So here we're looking at uh, people who are essentially non-responders. That is, they've got a pain intensity reduction at the end of the trial of less than 15%. And in these trials, there's a three-week titration period and a 13-week uh, maintenance period. And you can see that there's some uh, re pain reduction in the first week or so. But for most people, largely because they've withdrawn, largely because of adverse events, you can see that uh, their pain intensity uh, is high for the, almost the whole course of the trial. If we move the uh, hurdle up now to ask about those with a pain intensity reduction of 15 to 29 percent, uh, there are fewer of them, but you can see there's a gradual, gentle 
decline in pain intensity, but it is consistent then over the course of the trial with final pain intensities somewhere between about 4 and 8. If we raise the bar again to a, a, a final pain intensity reduction of 30 to 49% of the baseline, again one sees this more rapid initial reduction with again the pain intensity being maintained over the course of the period, uh, with here with pain intensities at the end of the trial somewhere between about three and six. And in the ones that we think of as full responders, uh, those with a pain intensity reduction of 50% over baseline or more at the end of the trial, what you see is during the titration period, a rapid reduction in pain intensity, and again, that pain intensity maintained in most people uh, over the course of the study with one or two uh, excursions. So we can say not only are the, um, these various outcomes similar with one another, but we can also say that when a patient attains one of these outcomes, the outcome is consistently held over the course of the trial. Which leads to the next step, which is to say, well, if you have this degree of consistency, can you also have a degree of predictability? And I believe we can. What we decided to do, since there's a period of um, uh, titration involved, we decided to look at various time points, and I'm showing you the week six results here, and asked whether non-response at that point was predictive of non-response at the end of the trial. And what one sees in red there is that for those people who are non-responders at week six, that is defined as having less than 30% pain intensity reduction at week six, 90% of them failed to have a better result than that by the end of the trial. So that we can say with some confidence that if you don't get a good result by week six, there's no point in carrying on. It is futile and treatment can be stopped. And that's a very important a practical result to be taken into clinical practice. And at the same time, we've answered all these questions about um, consistency. So, in, in brief summary then, final pain intensity, pain intensity reduction, and PGIC are all very, very closely related, and typically a patient has one of those outcomes, has all of them. The response is consistent. Patients tend to respond early and then continue with the same level of response over the course of the study right until the, the end, and that we can suggest a stopping rule so that failure to achieve at least 30% pain intensity reduction after six weeks of titration is a signal to discontinue treatment and try another one. Now, I just want you to note that for brevity here, I've only talked about tepentadol data, uh, but these results uh, apply to all the treatments uh, in these studies. Thank you very much indeed.